To be honest, the mission building up to the boss was really fun. Hijacking toothpicks, trying to get the band and other stuff. <laughs> oh, to think that that's... Oh my god. You know, of all the times my early countdowns have been absolute garbage, Manly's favorite bosses was easily one of the more tolerable ones. Had some problems, sure, but... God damn it, if I... God damn it, I'd be lying if I say that I didn't enjoy it. But, you know... I guess I could remake the list at some point. Or better yet, why not just do it now? So for those who have no idea, Top 10 Least Favorite Bosses is my most popular countdown on my channel thus far, and I can really see why. However, while there are a lot of mishaps, it's still kind of a fun video to go back to. But however, due to my improvements as a countdown maker, I think it is time to bring this list into the spotlight. So when it comes to boss fights, you got a couple categories and those being that they could be the most memorable part about the game, or an absolute slog to go through. Bad boss fights can categorically cause themselves as being one of the biggest low points in any video game, good or bad. Whether they're too easy, too hard, a rush mess, etc. Also, a couple bosses from my original list will make a comeback to this one, because I've fought a lot more horrible bosses since then, and I've fought more carefully about my choices. So not much to really say other than let's complain about bad boss fights. I have a huge love-hate relationship with both Infamous 1 and 2. I love the stories and characters, the presentation is pretty sweet and whatnot, but man, when you enter another location, it seems that the games can end up being extremely tedious. However, the bosses are some of the most unmemorable parts about the series aside from a couple exceptions, and the final boss in Infamous 2's good ending is no exception. To further on, I need to explain a bit of context. Throughout Infamous 2, you have to collect blast cores in order to charge up the RFI in order to kill the beast. Later on in the game, the beast turns out to be John White, whose powers is basically like a ray sphere and activates conduits which cures them of the plague, but at the same time, he's killing people that aren't. Once you reach the final mission, the RFI isn't fully charged, and it turns out that using it will eventually kill all conduits, including Cole himself. For most of a good ending, you're basically just traveling around New Marias finding electrical boxes to charge up the RFI, all while the beast and even Crow are attacking you. But this ain't for fight against the beast, you're fighting against Crow, and her attacks are standard and normal. And now once you charge up the RFI to its full power, we can finally take down the beast once and for- Really? That's all there is to it? Ladies and gentlemen, the easiest final boss I have ever fought! Now then, I do understand why they did this, showing the potential of the RFI's fully charged capabilities. But this capability should have been nerfed for gameplay. You fight the beast at the very beginning of the game, and he puts up a goddamn fight. Hell, every other boss fight, even Bertrand, imposed as a great threat. This is supposed to be the final boss. If Devil May Cry 2 taught us anything, is that if full cannon power is related to that in gameplay, that being OP as frick, then it's not fun at all. If I could at least change things to this fight, nerf the RFI's power, and at least make it play like the first boss of Infamous 2, and not end it in like 5 seconds. If there's anything I kind of regret, it would definitely be putting Sheriff Toothpick on my original list. I mean, yeah, the fight's a huge difficulty spike, but at least he puts up a good fight. Unlike Surreal La Paradox. For being the final boss of the final game in the Sly series, I'm actually disappointed. 
at least with every other fight, they impose the challenge to you all while adding fun gimmicks like in McGriz's battle. But here, all you have to do is basically jump around the area until you get to La Paradox, and this section relies on quick time events in order to damage him. I mean, brah frickin' vo. Every other boss allows you to damage the boss on your own, so having the game damage the thing for me is just freaking bing bing wahoo. Then a railing section appears and then a cutscene plays about why the Paradox killed his father and stole the Koopa Canes and Sly rants on about how the Paradox was being an idiot for stealing the Canes because of his egotistical actions. And then we're back to the final section of Quick Time Event. Oy vey. It really sucks they ended the series off on such a low point, and I know that bosses as characters themselves don't matter too much, as they don't affect my opinion towards them. Even before the fight, I've never really liked La Paradox all too much, but none the way as like, he's a villain so you're supposed to hate him. I just think he's pretty boring. Just like with the Infamous series, the bosses in the Ratchet and Clank series are some of the most unmemorable parts about the games. The first Ratchet game doesn't have that many bosses, only about four of them if I remember correctly. And what I also remember correctly is that Chairman Drek can go suck a fat one. After going through the hellhole of a cheap as hell final level, it ends with Hell Half No Fury. This battle comes in three phases and they all suck. But the first phase honestly is the least problematic, having to fight Drek one on one is Giant Clank in a mech fight. And it would have been epic if Giant Clank isn't jank as heck with stiff movement. I get the Giant Mechs are the most well known thing to program and especially in all of these games, so I can't be too mad. But then the second phase starts to break all hell. You're constantly chasing Drek and shooting him until he moves to another part of the arena, and you constantly have to shoot him down over and over till the final phase. But the problem with this segment in particular is that it takes a goddamn eternity for Drek's health to deplete, dodging his attacks is a nightmare, and because it didn't take till Ratchet 2 to introduce strafing, it's just a nuisance. Never mind the fact that you're constantly wasting ammo comprehensively making this fight an overglorified damage sponge, even if all the ammo crates stacked in areas. But worst part about this fight is the final phase. Drek will shoot everything he has at you, leaving you in a cluster truck of onslaught attacks, firing endless, potentially getting damaged in the process. Good luck trying to beat this thing without the Rhino, which in my case I did manage to only slightly because god damn it, those missiles really could have helped me a lot easier. But one weapon won't be enough to change how tedious this boss fight is. Just because the final boss is meant to be the most difficult part of the game, doesn't give it an excuse to fire off everything at once or take forever to goddamn kill. Alright, time for a fight that returned from my original list, but with the beat of the twist. From my original list, I've had the fight against Hakumen when you play as Rachel. But nowadays, I've grown to love Rachel's gameplay and even got better at playing as her. Heck, I've also realized that Rachel vs Hakumen isn't my least favorite fight in the game anymore. Oh no. Hakumen is a pain to fight with anyone. There are fights that could be considered worse than this, such as Hazuma in his unlimited form from Blaze Blue Continuum Shift, but because of only playing Calamity Trigger, I had to go with Hakumen, especially since he's the most broken character in the freaking game. That's especially because he is a long range fighter and getting it once deals a load of damage while you deal less than 5% of his health. I understand that he's slow as hell and you gotta bait him out and punish him. And if you also block his C attacks he is wide open. But when he hits like a tank and depending on the fighter you're using can be near damn impossible. Especially if you're playing as characters that don't have much HP as others or if they're short ranged. Maybe at least, oh I dunno, nerf the damage a bit for Hakumen for the story mode or hell as well as arcade mode for all I care. It's pretty satisfying when you beat this son of a bitch because you just beat the most broken character in all the Calamity Trigger. Man, Hakumen was about to trigger all the Calamity inside me. It's very easy to see what the hell went wrong with Mega Man X7. 
Never mind about the fact that Like Mega Man X6 is one of the worst video games I've ever played, but because the bosses feel more like damage sponges compared to the previous games. Granted, I'm kinda glad that the bosses give you more time to fight them, but besides that, every boss in X7 sucks, including the boss with the sentence engraved in my brain for the rest of my life. All of X7's bosses are pretty bad, with the exception of a fight against Sigma, and I could have picked a lot of them for my most expected choice, like Tornado Tanyan, but Flame Hyen Art is just goddamn abysmal, and it deserves to be. Never mind about the fact that his voice is on par with X as the worst voice in the game, but also because of the battle itself is retarded. At the start of a fight, Hyenar clones himself and you get to pick up the real one, until you realize that no damage is taken off them, that both of them are clones and the real one is on the mech. And this is when things start to get so tedious in itself. Hyenar's main attack is summoning his clones surrounding and circling you. Good luck trying to get out, cause if you attempt to, Hyenard and his clones will tackle you back to the frickin' middle. The missiles that he summons from a mech are incredibly painful to dodge as well. And never mind about the fact that the audio portion played through this fight is ear rape inducing. Granted, X7 all in all has a lot of issues with the audio, but in Flame Hyenard's case, it's especially bad. You have the fire of your shots, all while that annoying boss theme that plays during the fight, and of course the fact that I can't go even one second in the fight without Flame Hyenard spouting off his annoying catchphrase he oh so desperately loves to use that makes Sonic's your too slow taunts from Brawl ear pleasing. I mean, Jesus, I take dumps that are less stinkier than this. So yeah, frick this boss, frick the fat but he's suffering, and I hope he rots in literal hell. The drastic changes from the first game to Jack 2 is very mesmerizing. While it is still one of the hardest 3D platformers I've ever played, it's also really enjoyable to exploit your way around said challenge. However, the bosses are probably the weakest part about Jack 2 for me. Each of them are tedious in their own ways with a lot of them using gimmicks that for the most part really suck. Hell, Metal Core is considered to be the hardest boss in the game, and yeah, he's difficult, but compared to Crew, I found Metal Core to be the easiest boss fight in the whole game. Despite doing jobs for him, it's really expected for Crew to end up betraying you near the end of the game, concerning the fact that he is the crime lord of Haven City, and his attitude, speech pattern, and tone gives off a disturbing vibe. I get the penultimate boss is meant to be challenging, but challenge can end up drawing the line at some point. Crew's battle consists of electrical clones of himself, and it would have worked if you forgot the fact that this is Jack 2 Renegade, meaning that brutal difficulty will be present. The window of opportunity you get from attacking these things is really small. You have to be precise as hell as one screw up can end up with you eventually getting stun locked by the clones surrounding you from every bloody corner in the arena. Not to mention that a multitude of them come at you at once with most of them sneaking up from behind you or the side where the camera won't catch it. At least ammo crates spawn from time to time whenever you need to collect more ammo, because you will definitely be here a while. And when Crew does decide to throw his ass on the line, he will do frick all if you just do the jump, spin, and shoot strategy with the blaster. And good luck using that strategy which works around 90% of the game, excluding this particular boss fight. Back to the part where I stated that the clones will stun you, using this particular strategy won't work as you'll probably land on top of one of the clones. Maybe this is so that the fight adds balance into the mix, but this is Jack 2. Balance is non-existent. At least Crew's legacy lingers on in Jack X Combat Racing after his death. One part about my original list that is questionable, is that the Death Egg Robot from Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was my original number one. And don't get me wrong, I still hate it, but at the very least, I can give it credit because it is the final boss. 
unlike the Antlion from the Game Gear version. The problem with this fight is how much of a brutal difficulty spike it is. Eggman shoots cannonballs down the hill attempting to hit Sonic but dodge it to hit the Antlion. It sounds like a good concept for a boss fight if one, we actually got rings in the arena. So if you get hit once, you're fricked over. Two, the Game Gear's obsession with screen crunching your games makes the Master System ports all the more tolerable. But because of that, it makes dodging the cannibals all the more a chore as the cannibals can bounce from off the screen coming off as a randomized pattern. Three, because of this game's slippery controls, if you even dare to move, or worse, press down on the D-pad, you'll hit the Antley into the majestic realm of hell. And four, at least with the Death Egg Robot, it's the final boss. Here, never mind the fact that the Antlion has the difficulty of a final boss, but it isn't. It's actually the first boss in the game! And what is even worse, is that the acts are short as hell in Underground Zone, that you will reach this fight in the first 3 to 4 minutes of the entire game. Congrats, Sega, you done goofed yourselves. I wholeheartedly recommend Shadow of the Colossus, as it is an immersive experience even when fighting the unique bosses and taking a look at this game's majestic scenery of the Forbidden Land. However, it is also a game that is tested well, with some baffling design flaws. Some colossi will stunlock you, you taking a goddamn eternity to get back up. While I didn't have too much of an issue with aggro, I will admit that acting like a real horse doesn't work in a video game. And in the original PS2 version, the lighting was brightly abysmal. Hell, I desperately wanted to put Bassaran on this list because of how the method you're meant to beat him really doesn't work with a lot of camera issues when riding aggro. But after replaying this game multiple times, yeah, I picked Celosia instead. Both the Mini Colossi, Celosia, and Zenobia are some annoying bosses, albeit for some differentiated reasons with the conflict against Zenobia, which I believe to be the most overrated fight in the whole game. Celosia's weakness is blocked off by the armor attached to its back. What you have to do is lure Celosia to hit a platform to knock off a torch, grab it, light it, and use the fire to draw Celosia to the back of the arena to knock it off and break its armor. My gripe with this is that like most other colossi, Celosia will immediately see you as a threat for embarking on its territory and attack you which isn't bad in itself, but its attack hits hard. One hit will send you down, causing you an eternity to get back up, you get up, and then get knocked over by Celosia again, rinse and repeat. Hell, if the torch blows out while you're still luring Celosia to the cliff, you better pray to light the torch again before Celosia knocks you over. When you do manage to expose its weak points, this is when the battle gets even more frustrating. When trying to attack its weakness, Celosia will stop and attempt to shake you off. Then run, rinse, and repeat. Not only is the pattern completely random for me every replay through, but you also have a very thin amount of time to attack while also worrying about your stamina running out. For a game fighting massive and gigantuous beasts with many of them being incredibly majestic, the game puts you into the world of thinking if killing each colossi is really the right choice, leaving you with unsatisfactory and questions on your mind. But here, it's actually satisfying to kill Zelosia because of all the crap it pulled me through. One huge mistake I made with my original list is putting the rematch with Dante from Devil May Cry 4 on the list. After replaying the game, all I've said was basically describing how great this fight is. And now that I've played more of the game, specifically the trilogy, let's pick a proper bad boss. I could have picked any from DMC1 and especially Devil May Cry 2, but I decided to go with one from Devil May Cry 3. This game shares the same problem with Jack 2 in terms of bosses, only DMC3 handles it better. The fights against Cerberus, Nevin, Lady, and especially the final boss fight against Virgil are a bundle of fun, but before the final boss, suffering through Arkham was worse than I had anticipated. 
Mission 19 was already a tedious mission to go through, and waiting at the end is one of the most annoying penultimate boss fights I have ever faced. Arkham was set up as a deranged psychopath that sacrificed his own wife due to the obsessiveness of the demon world to gain the power of a god, and even as a split personality with his jester persona. Even teaming up with Virgil for most of the game whilst having their own motivations. Having Arkham be this... jelly... thing is questionable enough, but the meat and bones of his attacks really ruin it. He only has free attacks and they all suck. Most of the time, you could just wail on him, but he can also attack you with his tentacles, and that would just sounds wrong. He also barfs on you as another of his attacks, probably as a part of his funny guy personality, but the worst attack he has is easily summoning a whole bunch of minions to feast on you. These things are super annoying to kill, as not only are you constantly surrounded by them, but also because you'll possibly lose a crap ton of HP. But that's only the first half of the fight. In the second half, it becomes a tag team where Virgil joins the fight with you. And this sounds cool and awesome. Two brothers teaming up in gameplay. But the problem is that he takes away one of your input commands. You can't use double trigger at all during this phase. But because Virgil is assisting you during this fight, I can kind of understand why they had to take it away. But it still doesn't make it a nuisance. But however, the way both the Sons of Sparta finish him off is so satisfying. At least the fight ended in such a jackpot moment. I get that the concept of this fight, as well as the message in Devil May Cry 3, is how lust for power for committing villainous actions can end up unrewarded as a sufferable consequence. But this is why adding your message in gameplay doesn't work most of the time. Like how adding the message during the Arkham fight in DMC Freed suffered horribly, No More Heroes 2 did the exact same thing with one of its bosses. For the trinity of the worst bosses in No More Heroes 2, Jasper, Million Gunman, and New Destroy Man, yeah, I despise the fight against Million Gunman, and as for New Destroy Man, yeah, I hate it, but I hate Ryuji and Chloe Walsh more. So of course, I wasn't expecting much out of this fight since back when the countdown community was still more so alive, Everyone ranted about how abysmal the fight was, eventually becoming a punching bag for all boss fights. And I was late onto the train with the No More Heroes series, but by the time I got to fighting Jasper, yeah, he's horrible. To provide context, he was set up as the main antagonist that killed Travis's best friend Bishop because Travis killed Jasper's father and brothers. Yes, the entire plot of Desperate Struggle revolves around free assassination missions in the first game leaving Travis in a state where he wants to kill anyone to get to his best friend's killer. But then after thinking of letting Ryuji go as Travis believed he fought like a true warrior and an equal to him before Sylvia gunned him down, he started to change. This happened once again with the third ranked assassin Captain Vladimir after Travis killed him. Travis told Sylvia and her UAA cronies to let him rest in peace. But then after killing Alice, Travis went all out ranting about how killing was sacrificing his humanity all for his revenge, typically realizing how much killing had changed him and suffered the consequences for his actions, threatening to shut down the United Assassins Association. But what really bothers me about No More Heroes is that all the development he had in the first game was somehow back to ground zero in this game, and the same happened again with No More Heroes 3. Travis just shrugged off all the development and went after Bat anyways. What the fuck? You gotta be shitting me! The entire fight is a free phase cluster truck. The first phase is mildly simplistic. He rides his vehicle while trying to ram you over so you have to counter him to damage him. This phase is fine in itself, but the worst goddamn part about this fight, and I think every No More Heroes fan will agree with me on, is Jasper's second phase. Despite the music being awesome like in every case in No More Heroes 2, even on the lowest difficulty, this phase is tough as nails. He revolves teleporting across the entire room, all while telegraphing his punches. This wouldn't be so annoying if 1. His punches didn't hit like a truck, and 2. Would be the fact that if you somehow get punched by the windows, yeah, that's an insta-kill. And during his teleporting punches will enhance further later on in this phase when he adds wind elementals to his punches, causing him to be faster with his teleportation, all while getting stun-locked and spamming on the ground to get back up. 
this phase effectively ruined this fight for me. But then the third phase comes around and it's kinda mediocre at best. The biggest problem with this phase is the camera, and it's not because of your camera angle, but because Jasper takes up 98% of the screen, so you won't be able to see his attacks properly. Hell, it's even unsatisfying to kill Jasper, and don't you give me that excuse that it's meant to be like that because the message of the game is that revenge is meant to be unsatisfying. For all the bosses I hate, I have a lot of satisfaction for killing each of them, but Jasper just ended up being a lame excuse. No More Heroes 2 had a great story with a lot of flaws in its narrative, but ending it off like this just drained the life out of me. If Alice was the final boss instead, I would have no complaints whatsoever. What makes Zillia a whole lot of fun compared to other games in the Tales series is linking with one of your other party members, especially since you could pull off combos together and work together to defeat bosses and monsters. However, at certain points the game will take that away from you, making you the only party member active, and Mila's exclusive third arc in her story is no different. The Spirit Realm is a place I'm not the fondest of. To put it short, you have no idea where you have to go sometimes, the place is dull and lifeless, the song is more hollow than the inside of a tree, the narrative is boring and uninteresting, combat is a joke, you barely gain EXP, and that last one is especially a catastrophe because it is home to the worst boss battle in the game, Blueberry Ice Cream I mean Muse. Never mind that you're the only one active in a game about coordinating with your party, but even if the moveset you have on Mila works on Muse, it's still a bad boss fight nonetheless. If you get hit by one of her attacks, you're basically just asking for death. They'll either take off a frick load of damage or stun you to the fact that you can't do anything and get instantly killed. All of her attacks really get under my skin. Specifically the move Sharpen Pedal, Sharpen Whip, Stun Blitz, and especially Cyclone. Elemental Him is honestly kind of the least of my worries, but it is still a pain to dodge. I was so upset at this battle that I returned to the last point and met a merchant to buy an item that stops time momentarily. And I bought a lot of them that I wasted all my gold. I wasted all of the currency in the game I earned from beating bosses and enemies in order to beat this one boss. Oh, but this is a JRPG, why not just grind levels? Yeah, good luck with that, you don't get much EXP from defeating enemies in this place. Plus, you're only in the spirit realm for like 1 or 2 hours, so what the hell's the point of grinding for like 1 or 2 levels? The worst part is that this is far from the final battle. Yes, I found every other boss in the game to be easier than her. At least Muse found one way to annoy me. While I'm not as big of a fan of Pokemon as I used to be, I still love this series. Encountering and battling the gym leaders is one of my favorite moments in the series and definitely the most iconic moment in all the games. Proving your might and pushing your limits to bring all you got to best them to gain the gym badges to enter the Pokemon League. While I'm currently going through Pokemon Heart Gold, I love this game and have some amazing gym battles. Falconer is probably my favorite first gym battle in the series thus far, and Bugsy is quite a fun time. Whitney, on the other hand, is a huge mass in difficulty. The infamy about Whitney for being the banes of people's childhood in gold and silver or the remakes is definitely worth seeing why when I finally fought against her for the first time this year. I've always had trouble against Whitney for the same reasons that everyone else does too. As a character, I love Whitney. She has a cute personality with a lot of charm in her characteristics. But as for the Pokemon and the moves she uses, her Clefairy will be the least of your worries during my fight, and it was kind of amusing. But then, oh man, the worst Pokemon of the bunch is of course her goddamn Miltank. Excuse me, what? Miltank's base stats are absurd with 105 defense and 100 speed with high attack power and speed defense. Because of that, it'll take multiple hits to faint it. But Miltank has insane moves for a third gym leader to have. Stomp, which causes a 30% chance of inflicting flinch unless the target has a substitute. Rollout, that causes the user to roll into the target for 5 turns, which also doubles the power every time it is used. And with Miltank having such high base stats that could be on par with a legendary Pokemon, that is ridiculous. 
and because her mill tank is a female, if it uses attract on one of your male Pokemon, good luck getting out of that infatuation before that Pokemon faints. And just when you think you've hit the home stretch, crash, boom, bang, uses milk drink to restore 50% of its lost HP. And dear god, if it uses a lumberry, it can cure all non-volatile status conditions even if it gets confused. Frickin' brilliant. The best strategy I can give is before entering Goldenrod City where her gym is located, the daycare is right near the entrance, so what I did is I plant my Pokemon there, walk and walk for freaking eternity up and down areas we've been to in the Johto region, and grind 10 levels higher than Whitney's Mill Tank. Cause 2 levels higher ain't enough, 5 levels higher is kinda ain't enough. So try 10 levels and come back to me with the end results. Some say it could be considered cheating, but look, Whitney cheated first. If her level 20 mill tank learned milk drink when it's supposed to be learned at level 35, I can use preschool staff to help me get stronger. Alright, time for the final boss of my original list to show up. Man, he really does make Dr. Octopus proud, huh? Dr. Octopus! Kind of felt like a long time since I last talked about Star Fox Zero. While I think it is a legitimately good game, suffers from a lot of issues. Mainly due to the controls, how the gamepad screen is in first person mode, while the TV screen is regarded to how the camera would be in all other games in the series. But my god, this makes the game absolutely frustrating to play at times, and combining all problems of the game to the final boss fight against Andros. Andros is inside this glass tower thing, or whatever the heck it's supposed to be, and you have to find an opening to gain entry to attack him. He will also shoot lasers that will make Dr. Octavius goddamn proud, and all of this sounds like it should have worked, but due to the core annoyances of the abysmal control scheme, winning seems like a dim hope. Most of the time, you'll have to consistently look up from the gamepad to the TV just to see where the hell you're going and not stray too far away from the boss. And those lasers are somewhat of a bit of a nuisance to dodge. When you do find an entryway into the tower, Andros will turn to metal all while switching to the walker returning from the initially cancelled Star Fox 2. While the walker is honestly the easiest transportation to use out of the four, it still isn't the best controlling as trying to hit Andros can be a big pain in the ass. All while his attacks can revolve around slamming and punching with his hands with predictable as frick weak points, but hitting them can be absolute janked. And later on in the fights will add attacks to pull you in with magnetic force, and when both hands are down, adds attacks where he'll shoot laser beams from his eyes and toss debris of the arena towards you. Oh, I wish I had gotten to the final segment of the game, but I haven't because I can't beat this fricker. Get the You shut the up! Maybe this seems a bit unfair to myself because I haven't played Star Fox Zero since either 2019 or 2020, back when my Wii U gamepad still functioned and worked, and maybe my mindset would change on this fight if I fought him today. But for now, this boss ranks at this spot due to painful memories. Thanks a whole bunch, Nintendo! Oh, oh, oh man, have I been wanting to talk about this game for quite some time. Final Fantasy XIII 2 is not only a game I prefer to play over the first game, but because it fixed a lot of issues people have with the original. The areas and time paradoxes are a lot more replayable with loads of collectibles to find, and plus you could go to any area you want at any time when unlocking them, removing the linearity. You can save anywhere you want, and the story, while sometimes more convoluted than FF13, especially when explaining time paradox crap, is still pretty good. Inferior to the original, sure, but I've had a good time with the Holy Trinity, Sarah, Noel, and Mog. Other new characters are fantastic too. Yol, Alyssa, and my favorite character in all of the trilogy, Mother Trucking Caius Ballad. A badass villain with a cool motivation that his life depends on the multiple Yules. In Final Fantasy XIII 2 alone, Caius has 8 battles, 5 in his original forms and 3 in his Bahamut forms. 
However, after beating the final level Academia in the 500 AF timeline, you have to fight Caius four times. The first of which is his Chaos Bahamut form from the beginning of the game, then two battles against him in his normal form, back to back, once in Academia, another in Valhalla. And just when you think you killed him, freaking whoops! And as you can tell already, I despise the fight against Jet Bahamut. Holy goddamn crap, the massive curve in difficulty. The entire fight revolves around taking down two of the Bahamut, Amber and Garnet, in order to reach Jet Bahamut where he can attack you. Jet will cast Changing Skies, which gives Garnet and Amber status skills Bravery, Faith, Haste, Protect, and Skill, which are fine in itself as both of them are easier to defeat after their first defeat. But it's also really hard to keep track on both of them when they both have such monotonous inducing attacks. And yeah, they can respawn. They're just meant to block your path to hit Jet. And Jet himself isn't any better. Once Jet starts to throw his ass on the line, he will instantly use Break Curse which deals low damage, but also inflicts several status ailments such as Slow and Poison. Fun! Dark Flames, which summons fireballs across the arena, and make sure you defeat them before Jet uses Seeds of Destruction to blow them up. Judgment Blade, that does a considerable amount of damage, and make sure you switch to a Paradigm with the Sentinel. Below half HP will unleash Dying Sun, which does an incredible amount and is hard to defend against. But oh, oh, oh man, the last attack he has is the most painful and one that literally shakes the entire inside of my body. Jet will set a countdown to an attack that is easily its hardest hitting attack, that being its flare moves. Giga Flare, which does a wound damage, so that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> Remember when I said that both the Bahamut's infinitely respawn? Yeah, if one of them is alive when the countdown reaches zero, Terra Fleur arrives and does an insane amount of damage. But if all Bahamut's are alive and well, <laughs> Exa Fleur arrives and it's a move that can instantly kill. All of this would be fine since it is the final boss, but here's what I want to make clear. At the beginning, you get to choose between whether you want to play the game for easy or normal. And I decided not to pussy out like I usually do and went for the highest difficulty. Easy difficulty reduces every form of damage, even wound damage, which heals itself over time with some side effects that items aren't that dominant, and it's impossible to obtain an item drop boost from gaining 5 stars in a battle. So I went with normal and I stuck with it for the entire game, which made it challenging and fun. So what happened? Well, take a f***ing guess. I got so upset at this fight that I decided to strategically switch the difficulty from normal to easy. And even then, even goddamn then, he is still a pain to deal with. And compared to the three bosses before, which I found it to be even more easy than before, but in this fight, it only became slightly easier, which doesn't make it any better. I understand that this isn't the worst battle in the whole series, as there are other final bosses such as Yu Yevin from Final Fantasy X, and especially Orphan from Final Fantasy XIII that can be considered worse. But however, as much as I hate the fight against Orphan, at least it becomes less of a chore later on. Plus, at least Orphan doesn't have his minions to cower behind. Only took until Lightning Returns for God of Light Bunafelza to be the only good final boss in the whole FF13 trilogy. But before we reach my new least favorite boss fight, let's talk about some dishonorable mentions. Vamp from Metal Gear Solid 4 was on my original list. Cheeky as hell and I'm not that big a fan of the technique used to beat him. Dark Khan from Mortal Kombat vs DC Universe. Another one that was on my original list. Too many moves that stun you. Ripper Road from Crash Bandicoot. Another one that was on my original list. Cool concept for a fight but a piss poor execution. Polygon Man from PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale. You're just basically fighting infected fighters most of the time. Trick Master from Kingdom Hearts. Jumping, jumping, jumping. What else to goddamn say? Crimson Helm from Okami. An easily forgettable battle. 
and Baron Burr from Super Mario Galaxy. Ends in seconds and goes down pathetically easy. So, do you all remember the answer from Persona 3 Fez? It's so hard to forget the beautifully influential plot about the MCC and deep and compassionate moments with emotionally invested parts such as the character developments for each character. Even I guess getting over the death of the MC and even the moment that I like to call the conflict of grievance. However, while the story is great, the gameplay can frick off. Or more specifically, the boss battles. While the gameplay is exactly the same as normal Persona 3, not only is there no option for an easy mode, but for normal, this game is tough as hell. This unfortunately makes the bosses super unfair with most of them having moves that have high critical rates and even dodge and evade moves on some of them. So not only is the Neo Minotaur my least favorite boss fight in gaming history, but also one of the most brutally difficult RPG bosses I have ever faced. We see this thing again in Persona 4 as a mini-boss in the true final level of the game, but before that, the Neo Minotaur's debut was extremely horrid. I wanna say I'm surprised, but this boss is from one of the most unfair boss lineups I have ever seen, so nothing really surprises me about these bosses anymore. But the moveset this thing carries is bloody insane. Sharp student that decreases the odds of sustaining critical damage, Windbreak that breaks someone's resistance to wind attack, Life Drain that can take away its opponent's 35 HP, Spirit Drain that can take away its opponent's 20 SP, but the rest of its moves can all go together in one way or another, because if it ups its attacks and or critical rate, you're guaranteed to be at an incredible major disadvantage. Power damage that doubles physical damage, mind damage that doubles magic damage, wind amp that strengthens its wind attacks by 50%, maracunda that can decrease every foe's defense, revolution greatens critical rate for everyone in the field, and apt pupil that increases the user's critical rate. If one of these moves are used first and uses either Vicious Strike that takes away a mass amount of damage to all foes, Acacia Arts that deals heavy damage to all foes, or Megaru Dime that can deal an insane amount of damage to all foes in the next turn, there's possibly a higher chance of you and or your entire party's HP getting mostly terminated, an instant kill, or a crit. And don't forget, the main character you play as is Igis. And if she gets killed, round over. Hell, in the answer, because there's no easy mode, Plume of Dusks are non-existent, so there is zero room for error. This makes it all the more egregious since it has a lot of hard-hitting moves, and if you die, you have to restart from the last place you saved. Thankfully, Persona 5 Strike has years later fixed this issue that can make you restart the battle. It's such a pain in the ass as your strategy to beat him can be very minimalistic depending on the personas you fuse and use. In which case, some of them require persona hunting and fusing which may take a while and if you have the patience to even do so. By the time you get to this boss, you're basically halfway through the boss lineup and just past halfway through the game. I still haven't beaten this fight yet and it saddens me to see that I haven't gotten to the conflict of grievance yet. I would definitely love to put Yukari in her place. When this thing showed up again as a mini boss in Persona 4 Golden, I was worried about how it turned out. But it turned out to be a shockingly good fight. Game sequels really can improve with the time and effort put into it. I'm user one Campbell and hopefully tell me if you like this list more than the original or if this remake had more hiccups than the original list. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. But until then, I'm gonna get ready for the scariest time of the year and have a nice day everyone.